Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Jeff Durbin with Apologia Church. I want to thank you all so much for watching the content right here on Apologia Studios channel. Uh, what you're about to watch is a sermon, a message from Apologia Church's worship service. And again, I want to thank you all so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for sharing the sermon itself. We truly believe that it's important for the Christian church to have an engagement in the public square with the Word of God. So we thank you so much for partnering with us to send this out across the world. I just wanted to say something before you actually watch this, and that is that uh, I'm not your pastor. Um, though I'd love to be, I am not your pastor. And uh, um, it's very important as you're watching this, you know that uh, it's God's design for individual Christians to be part of a local Christian church under the care of qualified, faithful, biblical elders. And so as much as we love all of you watching these sermons and we're thankful to God that God uses them to bless you, to encourage you, I do want to encourage you as a minister of the gospel to get plugged into a local body of believers, particularly, I think, important uh, a reformed church would be would be best but we want to encourage you to get plugged into a solid biblical church where you can fellowship where you can worship where you can serve where you can be connected that is vitally important and actually a biblical command and so as much as again as we love for your participation your partnership and we are so thankful to god that he's using these in your lives we want to encourage you to get plugged into a local church. You can, though, actually partner with Apologia Church as we proclaim the gospel and provide a defense of the biblical gospel all around the world. You can do that by going to ApologiaStudios.com. You can partner with us by becoming All Access. When you do, you help to make all of this possible, and you get all of our TV shows, our after shows, and Apologia Academy. All of that, and you're a part of all that God is doing with us in the world to proclaim and herald the gospel of the kingdom. You can partner with us, and I want to say one last word about that. Do make sure that none of your giving and partnership towards Apologia Church interferes with your giving, your worship, your tithes, your offerings to a uh, local body of believers in your area. So thank you again so much for watching these and sharing them. God bless you. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 17. Making good headway now, moving through these chapters. And as you get there, first gospel in the New Testament, gospel according to Matthew. We call this series the Kingdom of God, even though Matthew chooses in his gospel to use the phrase the Kingdom of Heaven, really is synonymous with the Kingdom of God. The, one of the central themes in the entire Bible is the rule of God in history. God coming into history to redeem, to save, to undo all that was brought into the world through sin and death and evil. And so Matthew is telling you the story of the Messiah. God himself went into history to save his people, to restore and renew the world, to bring the new creation. The kingdom of God, central theme. So we call the series the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 17 now, after a significant section of scripture where Jesus talks about his church, the kingdom of heaven, he talks about the power to bind and loose on earth and in heaven. He talks about the gates of hell not prevailing against his church. He then tells them that he's going to suffer and die and on the third day be raised. He tells his people about coming to take up their cross to follow him, losing their life for the sake of finding it. He tells them that the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And he promises them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And now we open Matthew 17 on the tale of that. Hear now the words of the living and the true God. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and, they, and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that at first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Thus far as the reading of God's holy word, let's pray together as a church. Father, we come before you, Lord, as your people, Lord, humbled by the privilege that we have to have your words in our hands. Thank you, God, that you've gifted us this revelation, that you speak to us. Lord, you speak to all your people all over the world and all throughout time, Lord, through your revelation, your self-attesting revelation. Thank you, God, that you have given us the grace to know you, to be forgiven in Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for us, you rose again from the dead, that you're ascended and seated on your throne. Thank you that all your promises are yes and amen, that you keep your word always. You cannot lie. Thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to yourself. We pray, God, by your spirit that you would teach us today, Lord, in your word that you'd remove, Lord, the element of this jar of clay, a person who has no earthly right being here holding your word in my hands or telling anybody about it. Pray, God, that you would teach through by your spirit that, Lord, you'd guard my mind, my heart from error, that you'd build your church up, change us, cause us to love Jesus more. And, Lord, I pray that you would invigorate us, energize us by your spirit, teach us your word, and then let those wonderful things come from our mouths. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew chapter 17, Jesus now has told his people that some of them standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So you see this really throughout the New Testament. You see it quite a lot, actually, and it causes no small controversy amongst Christians in terms of how do you manage that? How do you manage the fact that Jesus did teach the Bible does teach that Jesus was going to return in that generation before they all had died. You see it in particular a lot through the gospel according to Matthew, this emphasis upon this impending judgment upon that first century generation. Your Bible, Matthew, kicks off, Matthew chapter 3, with Elijah, John the Baptist, coming in, first words out of his mouth, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God. The rule of God is at the fingertip reach. It's right there at the reach. It's here now. Repent, turn, have a change of mind. God's rule is now breaking into history. That's chapter 3 of Matthew. Matthew is, of course, doing that on purpose. He knows the entirety of the story, and so he's bringing the story together for us. This was the Elijah that we expected. If you look in your Old Testament, right before Matthew opens up, you can see it. So just do that. Keep one finger here in Matthew. Just move over to your Old Testament where it ends. You have that little white piece of paper there. That's the intertestamental period. And I want you just to see it now. Malachi, we have it now in order at the last of the Old Testament prophets. Look at Malachi, and you see in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, this discussion of Elijah. This messenger who's coming before the Messiah himself. Just look at chapter 3 of Malachi, just briefly. Behold, I send my messenger, verse 1, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, check that out, and the Lord whom you seek, this is the one we're waiting for, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. That's chapter 3 of Malachi. You're ending your Old Testament. You've got Elijah who's coming first, then the Lord whom you seek is coming to, listen to the words, his temple. That's what they expected. 
And you have, of course, a description in Matthew, Malachi 3, we've read it before, of the twofold nature of the coming of Messiah. It's going to be one, purification and salvation for God's people, and two, it's going to be judgment upon the covenant breakers. So this is the timeline they were accustomed to. Elijah comes first, and then the Messiah comes to his very temple. It's a twofold nature. It is one, judgment, two, purification and salvation. These things are all wrapped up in the coming of the kingdom of God in history. In Malachi chapter four, look there, verse one, behold the day is coming burning like an oven, oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming that shall shut them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, look, see twofold again, judgment, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Do you catch it? Twofold nature of the coming of Messiah. The messenger, the forerunner, Jesus, and then there's going to be judgment and salvation. And now enter Jesus in the text before us, Matthew chapter 17, you see Jesus going up to the transfiguration, but before that, you have that consistency with the Old Testament revelation. Jesus is going to judge the covenant breakers. The kingdom of God is gonna break into history. Some of you will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Again, all of this consistent with the Old Testament revelation. What did they know about the Son of Man? Well, they knew Daniel. Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 through 14. Daniel's night visions, one like a son of man, comes up to the Ancient of Days. He's presented before him, and to him, the son of man, is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting, eternal dominion. It'll never pass away. His kingdom, his rule, will never be destroyed. And isn't it amazing? In Matthew 16, Jesus just told Peter, what? About his kingdom. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's consistent with that Old Testament revelation. This is the Messiah that they expected. Although there were certain things about Jesus coming that they just couldn't understand. What do you mean you're gonna die? What do you mean you're gonna rise again? Peter's trying to tell Jesus it'll never happen, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. What's amazing is it wasn't that the Old Testament revelation didn't tell them this, it was that it was so glorious, huge, complex, complex and perfect and amazing, they couldn't have possibly understood it all, which makes Jesus and his earthly ministry so powerful. Why? Because if you read in the Gospels, John chapter 1 in particular, where it gives you this revelation of who Jesus is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It says that all things came into being through Him, and without Him, nothing came into being that's come into being. And it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. And then it tells us that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's a powerful testimony in John chapter 1. I want you to see it. Keep your finger there in Matthew just to get an explanation of just what is happening here in Matthew 16 and 17. So finger here in Matthew 17 and move to John. Over to your right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Very, very interesting gospel. Different than the synoptics, different than the first three in many respects. But I want you to see it because it goes along with everything happening here in Matthew 17 in terms of this, watch. The Father says to the disciples, this is the Son of my love, I love him. I am pleased with him, listen to him. In John chapter one, John gives that same story, same thing. It says in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out. That's John the Baptist. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, watch, here it is, ranks before me because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, 
the only God who is at the Father's side, did you catch that? The only God, Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. The Greek words there behind that, he has made him known, are essentially the same thing we talk about when we talk about exegesis. What's that? What's that mean? Drawing out of the text, what does it mean, right? God's word speaks and we draw out of the text. We don't add our stuff into the text and eisegete the text. We have it explained to us, draw out. So in this text here, we see that John says, he ranks before me because he was before me. He is Jesus, grace upon grace. And he says what? He says he's at the Father's side and he, Jesus, has explained the Father to us. Jesus, watch, exegetes the Father. He exegetes the Father to his people. He explains this is what the Father is like. Just consider for a second. Moses, prophet, amazing prophet of God. Wow. All of us, if we, conf- if we, we have to confess, if he walked in this room today, we would probably be so in awe. We'd probably do the same, kind of fall to our knees saying, let's build a tent. Let's do something to like commemorate this moment of Moses or Elijah or David or Isaiah or Jeremiah. These are amazing prophets of God, but you know what they're not? They're nothing like Jesus. Ultimately, ultimately, they're foreshadows of Jesus and what he is as perfect prophet, priest, and king, but they are nothing like Jesus. They can't explain the Father like Jesus. Why? This gets to everything that's in Matthew chapter 17. The Father says, listen to him. I want you to listen to my son. Let him be the foundation through which you view everything else. Stop focusing in upon Moses as supreme revelation and Elijah, the law and the prophets. If you want to know what the law and prophets are, you listen to my son. How do you know my son is trustworthy? Why? Because he is in the bosom of the father. John chapter one in Greek, as far back as you wanna go forever with no stopping. Jesus, he's already there. He was already there. He is proston theon, toward the Father, face to face with the Father, in intimate relationship with the Father, and he is fully God. You wanna know the Father? You listen to the one who has been an intimate fellowship with the Father from all eternity. And I wanted to say this, this isn't something we could possibly grasp. There's no way you can comprehend it. Try, you can't. Our three pound creaturely brains cannot fathom and understand, comprehend fully, the glory of the Trinity, the fellowship between Father and Son. Jesus knows the Father perfectly. And so when they go up to this high mountain for the transfiguration, they get just a blip, just a blip, just a moment where they actually see the tear in the physical. The physical world is split for just a moment, just a glimpse, just a small taste of what Jesus, who Jesus actually is. Earth, space, time splits and they get a glimpse of who they have been walking with, the transfiguration. And what does the Father want his people to do? Not to build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and memorialize them ultimately. You have my son, the son of my love, the one that I am pleased with. Listen to him. It's a powerful thing. You see, what's, what's, What's important for us to get is this about the scriptures, and it's gonna come back always at Apologia Church. We're always gonna talk about this. The Old Testament, glorious revelation of God, still, contrary to popular preachers of today, still relevant today, still true today, still to be appealed to today, still and always. It is the word of God, and it is always true. However, when you look at the Old Testament revelation, what you're looking at is the beginning of this grand revelation of God, this potent revelation of God. You have Moses, a prophet who speaks with God on a high mountain with the glory cloud of God receiving stone tablets 
from God to reveal to the people of God the law of God which could not save anybody, but the law of God which is good, which God says in Deuteronomy 4 was supposed to be their wisdom in the sight of the peoples. People were supposed to see the law of God given from Moses to the people of God, not as a curse, but as their wisdom. People were supposed to see the law of God and they're supposed to say, my goodness, what nation is there that has a God so near to them as the Israelites? And what nation is there that has laws, justice, statutes, so wise and perfect as this law? However, the thing is, you still have the problem of sin. The people of God are still in sin. The people of God haven't experienced what you and I have today, the resurrection that we have today, being made alive with Jesus, joined together with him in his death and his resurrection. They haven't experienced the outpouring of the Spirit of God. They have Moses, they have word from God that's a blessing, but they still have something else. What do they have? Physical temple. It's a temple that somebody can knock down, and it was knocked down in history, destroyed, set on fire, gold melting between the cracks. It's taken down. They have a city that can be destroyed, not a heavenly city yet, a temple that can be taken down. They have a priest who's a sinner who has to offer sacrifices for himself first. They have prophets of God, priests from God, but these guys come and they go. They live and they die. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. And when does it happen? Yom Kippur, annually, every day year. It's a reminder. This isn't done. This isn't okay. We're not right. How do I know? Because you know what? There's a holiest place that I can't even enter. And God builds this sanctuary to display what? A ritual to remind us. God, watch this. Here's what's important. Watch. The temple and the holy of holies? What? Heaven. Heaven itself can't contain God. Did you get that? Heaven itself can't contain God. God isn't stuck in the holiest place in the Old Testament. He's not hanging out there, not able to escape. It's a ritual. It is a walking through a sign. The priest is going in before the people of God to represent them before God, and he's going before a veil that blocks them from the holiest place. It's supposed to shout to God's people, it's not done. There's something between you and I. It's not as though our God is contained in this perfect box-shaped room. It's not as though the animal sacrifice is taking away any sin. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, and they knew it. Why? That thing is an image of God. That goat, the scapegoat, is not the image of God. That thing they're leading away from the people of God to watch their sins depart from them as far as the east is from the west, that's not image of God. That animal dying without spot and blemish is still not image of God. This is all patterns. It's all dress rehearsals. It's all rituals to do what? To testify about something far superior and more beautiful and more eternal. Because what do you have now in Jesus? The perfect prophet. What do you have now in Jesus? The perfect priest. What do you have now in Jesus? You have what the forerunner, Elijah, John the Baptist, said of him. What happened when they first introduced Jesus and John the Baptist testifies as a matter of history about who it is that they're dealing with? He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what we are waiting for. Just consider it Moses, amazing prophet of God. Elijah, representing the prophets, amazing prophet of God. Elijah's the man. He's the bomb. He is, seriously. If Elijah had a church today, you should go to his church because he's the man. He really is. But you know what's amazing about these two prophets? All they could do is lay down the rudimentary things because what? Jesus, who's in the bosom of the Father, hasn't come yet. He's not there yet. All they can do is give you the ritual, the symbol, and it is so rich just consider Moses for a second. What Moses tell him to do? Moses says, get a lamb, no spot, no blemish. They don't know why. All they know is God says and I do. That's it. He says, I do. I don't know why. He says, get a, a lamb, no spot, no blemish. Got it, check. Lamb, no spot, no blemish. 
by the way, don't break its bones. Okay? Don't break its bones. No spot, no blemish, check. Don't break its bones, check. Then take the blood of the lamb, no spot, no blemish. You haven't broken its bones? Haven't broken its bones. Okay, take the blood of that lamb now and you put it over your doorposts. Put the blood of the lamb over your doorposts. And then when my judgment comes, I will pass over that house on account of the lamb with no spot, no blemish, no broken bones, and you'll then be freed from your slavery in Egypt to enter into the promised land with God. They don't know why. It's a beautiful thing. Moses said to do it, and so they did it. But here's the thing. That wasn't the thing. That wasn't the substance. It was only pointing to the greater reality of what we have in Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God, with no sin, no stain, no deceit in his mouth, as Isaiah 53 says. And he dies when in history? On Passover. And when he was on that cross, the Roman guards broke the legs of the criminals with Jesus. They broke their bones, but they come to Jesus and they did not break his bones on Passover. And then at Passover, that blood was spilled for the people of God so that as we come near to Jesus and trust in the one who's in the bosom of the Father, his blood covers us and the judgment of God passes over us. We are redeemed pulled out of our slavery to sin to enter into the promised land of relationship with God. We have a heavenly city which can never be destroyed. We have a temple in the heavens, Jesus. All of us are little stones, Peter says, being built up into the house of God. We have a priest now forever in the heavens who intercedes for us right now. He's praying for you right now. He's interceding on your behalf. We have a priest now who lives in the heavens forever who has taken his seat on that throne after he split that veil. Never forget that on the day of the atonement, the eternal once for all atonement, that veil split, it tore, signifying what? That now it's finished. It is finished. Now we can enter into that holiest of holies. We enter into the presence of God himself now with bold and confident access. Why? Because we have Jesus. It's finished. It's over. Now, I I lay all that down to say, when we understand the purpose of the pattern fulfillments of the Old Testament, we can fully understand this moment of the transfiguration where Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets, show up next to Jesus and are conversing with him. How crazy would that? That must have been nuts. You can definitely sympathize with the apostles there on this high mountain seeing this amazing split between heaven and earth open now and the glory of the true Jesus just shine through. I'm not trying to disassemble Jesus and his humanity and divinity, but you get my point. You see the glory of who he truly is just shine through for that moment. You can get for a moment why the apostles are like, let's build tabernacles here. Let's build some memorials on this mountain for the law and the prophets and Jesus. And right as they're speaking, the Father speaks from heaven. Doesn't happen all the time. It's actually a rare instance, pretty rare in history where the Father speaks from heaven like this. You have it where else? Where else do you have in Jesus' ministry where the Father speaks from heaven? Where else? The baptism of Jesus. John the Baptist, the forerunner, is anointing Jesus as priest. Jesus isn't repenting of sin and being baptized. John's the son of a priest. He's a priest. He's anointing Jesus for his ministry. It gave Jesus the right as priest to be able to cleanse the temple and do what he did. But notice the Father spoke from heaven then too. He said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. That's the Father speaking. And another moment here, Moses, law and prophets, Elijah and Jesus, let's build some memorials here for these prophets. And the Father says, no. This is my Son. This is the Son of my love. You listen to him. What's that saying? It's to say that all of us are supposed to now filter all of the word of God everything, not going one direction from the old to the new, but we're supposed to see Jesus standing in the new covenant as the supreme revelation at the top of the mountain through which everything else is viewed. 
How are you supposed to view the law and the prophets now? You view them through the lens of Jesus. See, here's the thing. Oftentimes as Christians, we blow this. There are communions that blow this completely. There are many uh, examples that can be displayed happening today on this day in history where there are people who profess faith in Jesus and they're reading it all like Peter wanted to do. Let's put Jesus here in the long line of law and prophets and let's try to view them together, maybe even in order from Moses through. Let's try to interpret it backwards from Moses to Jesus. But the father says, no, you would now look to my son and you listen to him. Jesus is the full and final revelation of God himself. You listen to him. How are you to view the law of God now today in the new covenant? Through Jesus. How are you to view the prophets of the Old Testament through Jesus? He's the supreme revelation. Now, I want to just take you to a a really quick point. It's powerful. It's actually, it's amazing because Matthew's doing it a lot. He's doing it a lot here in this gospel. Do you notice, and I don't want to go over it again, but do you guys remember we spent time when we were in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 showing you that Matthew is actually trying to display that Jesus is, is what all those things were prefigures of. So for example, Jesus is a baby, and you have this story of a political ruler who tries to kill Jesus as a baby, and he narrowly escapes. What's that sound like? Who did that happen to in the Old Testament? Moses. Same thing. You have Jesus being led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness for 40 days. You have the whole, oh, I know what that means, Israel in the wilderness, wandering, But see, Jesus, as the true and perfect Israelite, goes through the wilderness wandering, and the trials that happen there, he accomplishes what Adam failed in and Israel failed in. Adam was to be God's light in the world. He failed. He disobeyed God. Israel was to be God's light in the world. He failed. They failed and disobeyed God. You see, Matthew is showing you that Jesus is what all of that was supposed to be. Now, in this text, did you know it's not isolated? that this happened before in history, what happens here? Some of you won't die, and then there's this experience six days later where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and leads them up to a high mountain. And he was, verse two, transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now watch, if you take your finger, keep it there in Matthew, and just move back to the beginning of your Bibles now. Go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Here's the law. Exodus 24, starting in verse 1. So you have your Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. We refer to that as the law of God. The Jews refer to it as the law. First five books of Moses. Check this out. Chapter 24 In verse 1, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet as it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the me on the mountain and wait there 
that, a, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So now, Jesus takes his disciples. He goes up to this mountain. And while on that mountain, verse 2, he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became white as light. Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking to them. Behold, watch, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Isn't it powerful? In the Old Testament, they can't foresee this moment with Jesus. They go up to this mountain. Moses is there. The cloud is there. The glory of God. They are just in awe of this moment, God gives them the law, the covenant. They say, we'll do all these things. And now in this moment with Jesus, his kingdom's coming. He takes his disciples up and that cloud is there. They get to stand in the midst of the story now with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And the father says, now listen to him. Listen to my son. Do you know Peter talks about this moment? Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody until I've risen from the dead. Don't do that. Don't tell anybody. But Peter did actually talk about this moment. So I want you to go to your Bibles now to 2 Peter 1. Listen to what Peter says about it. 2 Peter, near the end of your Old Testament, chapter 1. I'm, gonna actually, I'm actually going to read a little further above, and that's in verse 14. No, 13. Okay, 2 Peter... Chapter 1, verse 13. Here's what Peter says. This is near the end of his life. I think it is right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. You know where that was? If you read the end of the Gospel of John, just mark it down, read the last chapter of the Gospel of John, and you see the interaction between Jesus and John and Peter and it's a prophecy of Jesus there at the end of the gospel according to John where Jesus tells Peter that he's going to be martyred. He's going to die for his faith in Jesus. He just reconciles Peter to himself and then he tells him that when he is older, someone's going to take him where he doesn't want to go. He's going to die as a martyr. And of course, Peter in that moment looks over to the other disciple and he says, what about him? He goes, what about him? And Jesus says, watch, this is big. It goes along with everything I'm saying in terms of the eminent judgment in the first century church and generation. Jesus says to Peter, when he tells him he's going to die, and then Peter says, what about John? He says, if I will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. If I will that he lives until I return, what? In judgment. What's that to you? What business is that of yours, Peter? You follow me. That's another example, by the way, of the fact that Jesus was clearly telling his disciples that he was returning in that generation to judge. If I want John to be around until I come back to judge, that's none of your business, Peter. You follow me. By the way, do you know who the only disciple was? This is awesome. It's awesome. Do you know who the only disciple was to live through the destruction of Jerusalem? and die of his old age. You know, the only one to survive all of that, it was John. He did live to see Christ come back in judgment on that generation. All the other apostles, they all died. John survived, and we know from history, John actually did take care of Jesus' mother Mary, and he buried her in Ephesus. John survived 
Nero tried to kill him. He failed. He sent John into exile to Patmos. That's another sermon to give. But here we go. Here's Peter, verse 16. He says, I know I'm about to die. Verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were, here it is, eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. See that? That's Peter now talking about that experience on the mountain. He says this about Jesus. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. You see, what's amazing about the life ministry of Jesus is that none of this is private revelation. Watch. What's the law of God say concerning accusations or claims being made? Receive no accusation against an elder unless it's on the basis of what? Two to three witnesses. What's the law of God in terms of confirming something? What is it? Two to three witnesses. What did Jesus bring up with him on that mountain? Three witnesses. Jesus brought the witnesses, and Peter's saying this. This isn't a fable. This isn't a myth. I'm not telling you tales out of the schoolyard. I was an eyewitness to Jesus. I saw his glory, and I heard that voice speak from heaven. I was an eyewitness to his majesty. Peter is telling you that story later on in his life before he's killed. He said, I saw him. I saw Jesus in his glory. And there's something about this moment that's just so peculiar. You know what it is? Because the life of Jesus, throughout his ministry, there's so much happening in the ministry of Jesus that tries to, well, I don't want to say try. It displays his humanity. So, for example, Jesus bled, right? Jesus got hungry. Jesus was beaten up. Jesus had his beard pulled from his face. They smashed a crown of thorns into his head. And I want to say this, that hurt. Jesus, because he's God in the flesh, it didn't mean that his humanity was somehow diminished and he didn't feel that pain. The abuse was less for Jesus. When Jesus was a little boy, I imagine that Jesus got stomach aches. I imagine when when Jesus hit puberty, Jesus got pimples. So we don't think about that often, do we? Because we see Jesus is God. But you know what? It's always emphasized through and through that Jesus is a perfect representative for you because he's truly human, fully human. Jesus had chosen to have limitations, limitations that humanity offers. Jesus was God and man. But here's a shining moment in the ministry of Jesus Up on this high mountain, the glory cloud of God, the law and the prophets and the Father shouting from heaven, this is the son of my love. I'm pleased with him. You listen to him, but this is a moment where heaven is opened and you see the glory of the son of man shining through. You see, Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter two. You read it later. Paul talks about the nature of of God taking on flesh. He said, Jesus, who is in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. But what did he do? He emptied himself. And he took upon the form of a servant. And he was obedient even unto death. And it's amazing because it's so complex, I don't understand it fully. None of us can the complexity of the incarnation. God, fully God, eternally God, omnipresent, full of wisdom, truth, power, justice, no sin, entering into our experience and coming into a mother's womb, being dependent upon breast milk. I don't get it. It's incomprehensible. God as a man, as a baby, held in his mother's arms, Mary being cautious not to drop Jesus. Mary being super cautious to keep an eye on Jesus' eating habits. 
right? Are you eating enough? Have I fed him enough, right? Because this is not somebody who's walking down the streets of Jerusalem glowing because he's fully God and yet fully man. And in this moment, in the transfiguration, up on that mountain, here's this shining moment of the law and the prophets and the Father and pointing to Jesus, and then heaven splits for a second, earth splits, and you see, this is who you're contending with. This is the majesty that really exists with Jesus. And it's super terrifying, if you think about it, because all through Jesus' ministry, his life and ministry, not everyone got to see this glorious moment where earth and heaven open up and the glory of Jesus shines through. So you've got people challenging Jesus. (laughs) Can you imagine if they had known that all God has to do is open up the heavens for a moment and they would have been on their faces, tearing their clothes, throwing sackcloth and ash. If they had known who they were dealing with, people who beat Jesus, people who argued with Jesus, People who were trying to get Jesus turned over to the authorities, they had no idea what they were doing. But the glory of the incarnation is that this God, he humbled himself, he walks among us. And this is, I gotta tell you, that when I was preparing for this message, honestly, I had this moment, this real profound moment, and I don't don't know why it was so profound, I'm still trying to think about it, but I had this profound moment where as I'm reading this text, I'm thinking about how am I gonna present this, and I'm praying through it, and I'm trying to figure it out, to be a blessing to the church. The thing that got me the most this week, all of it's amazing. The thing that got me most is this moment where they are so terrified, so legitimately terrified, where all this stuff breaks open and they're just trying to figure out how to manage it. And they're saying, we'll build something for him and him and you. And then the father speaks from heaven and their response is absolute fear. They are so terrified that they're falling on their faces. They are so scared of this moment. And I love what Jesus does. This is what got me. Jesus comes over and it says, they fell on their faces and were terrified, but Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. Isn't it amazing that These are human beings who are sinners before God. They hear the voice of the Father, and they are so terrified. That's the voice of their creator. They know who they are. They know who he is. And their first response to hearing the Father's voice is to actually fall on their face in fear. And I love what Jesus does for his people who are afraid of the voice of their Father. He comes and he watches. He touches them. I encourage you to study the ministry of the touch of Jesus all throughout the Gospels. Jesus doesn't just stand to the side and talk to people. He comes up and he touches them. Jesus walks up to the disciples who were terrified of the voice of their father. He puts his hands on them and he says what to them? He says, get up. You don't have anything to be afraid of. You see, because we don't just have the law and the prophets, but we have Jesus Now watch, there is no fear between the Father and us. There's no reason for you and I, as followers of Jesus, to have, watch, an unhealthy fear of the Father, a terrified fear of the Father. Jesus stands between us and the Father. He puts his hand on us, and he says, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Why? Because I'm here. It's not just the law and the prophets, it's Jesus. Don't be afraid anymore. Jesus establishes, watch, a new way between us and the Father. Isn't it amazing? It's a powerful thought. Now I want to just finish here by talking about a couple things and then we're going to do our baptisms. Peter thinks that he, Jesus, is to be honored like the other prophets. He's to be honored like the other prophets. And what he learns from the Father is that when they're dealing with Jesus, they're dealing with something wholly new. I just want to point you to this passage. You don't have to go to it. I just want to read it for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, this is a prophecy about the one who's coming. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet 
like me, that's Moses, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Now, it's amazing in the Old Testament, Moses actually says, God's going to raise up a prophet like me from among you, and you are to listen to him. They get up on top of this mountain. Moses is there. The father says, here he is, the one who I've raised up out of the people just like you. Listen to him. It's a fulfillment of that prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Listen to the coming prophet, the one who now has arrived. Moses and Elijah are not irrelevant. This would be a wrong way to read this passage. Well, God says, no, you listen to Jesus now, so you don't need Moses and Elijah. You don't need the prophets. That's not what God is saying here. It's not that they are now irrelevant. It's that Christ is the peak from which we're to view everything else. Now, it says... Verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. That's a prophecy of his death and his resurrection, and it happened. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say first, that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he'll restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased, so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands." Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. I want to summarize this by saying, I think this passage is incredible testimony to the faithfulness of God that he keeps his promises. Just consider, Moses and Elijah were constantly foreshadowing and foretelling the story of Jesus. It's all pointing forward to Jesus as the ultimate. The Old Testament is giving direct prophecy. For example, Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers. You shall listen to him. That's one prophecy amongst so many. Direct prophecy. Jesus is coming. God keeps his covenant promises. Oh yeah, Elijah's supposed to come first. Jesus says he did. And they did to him whatever they wanted. It was John the Baptist. Just like it was foretold, he showed up. He will restore all things. And just like that Old Testament prophecy said, Elijah comes first, forerunner, then Jesus. Then covenant, judgment, and redemption. It all happened just like God said. Everything taking place throughout our Bibles is yes and amen. All of God's promises, all of his prophecies. And not only watch, in this moment, do you have all these prophecies fulfilled in this one moment on a mountaintop, and the glory of God shining through, but you also have Jesus once again testifying, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the dead. They could not completely understand that, but everything Jesus said happened. God said the forerunner is going to come, Messiah is going to come, then they will be judged, and redemption will follow. It all happened in the first century. Jesus says, I'm going to die and rise again. It all happened. So I want to end with this point. When you read a text like Matthew chapter 17 about the transfiguration, it's this swirl of pattern predictions fulfilled in this moment on top of a mountain. It's this swirl of specific prophecies predicted. Jesus fulfills them. And then more promises are being made. But I think the powerful thing to think about is that with Jesus, with his entrance into the world, he changes the nature of our relationship with the Father to remove our sin, to remove our fear, to bring us into an entirely new way with God. And all of his promises are sure and guaranteed and yes and amen, and there's no question. So when I read this text, I think about God's faithfulness throughout time, and I think about my unfaithfulness, and I think about my inconsistencies, and I think about my failures as a follower of Jesus. I think about my failures as a father, as a husband, as a human being. I think about my sins and my inconsistencies, and I'm reminded in a moment like this on a mountaintop with Jesus that God doesn't have the same problems that I do. God is faithful to his covenant promises. God is faithful to all of his promises. When God says something's going to happen, it happens. Nothing can alter it. And there are times where I hear something from God, watch, and I think, wow, that's amazing. And I can tell in this passage, we don't understand the half of it. It is so much bigger 
and more glorious. And if we could just have heaven and earth split for just a moment, we would see that it's more than we ever thought it was. And it would change us. So my question to you is this. How do you respond to this moment in history that Peter says he was an eyewitness to his majesty? How do you respond to it? Is it just an amazing story? Is that it? Is it just an awesome moment in history that shows how awesome Jesus is? Or are there things connected to this story that do relate to you very personally and intimately in your relationship with the Father? Can I ask you, are you in that place where you hear the Father's voice and you're still in fear and trembling on the ground? Or can you hear the voice of Jesus? Can you feel his touch where he says, you don't have to be afraid? Do you think God is like you? Half-fulfilled promises, inconsistency, jaded, indifferent? Or do you see in a moment like this that God is actually the faithful one? He is the sure foundation. He keeps his word, and he is intimately involved in everything that is going on here. Can you see in this moment that God hasn't forgot his promises, that he keeps them? Can you see in this moment that God isn't like you? And so here's the call. God says that Jesus is returning to judge the living and the dead. God says that he's going to redeem and restore the world. God says, watch, whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have the life, but the wrath of God abides in him. How do you respond to that? Will you repent and believe in the good news? Will you come to the Father through the Son and receive the Father's love and blessing and salvation and redemption? How will you respond to this message of God? Because here's the thing. Peter actually had a word from God. It's kind of powerful. He had a word from God. Peter, you're going to die a martyr's death. So Peter even tells you... um, I'm coming to the end here, guys. I know I'm about to be killed. He, he knew it. He knew he had some time, but he knew he was going to be martyred. You and I don't know that we have tonight or tomorrow morning or this week. You and I don't know how much time we have given to us by God to live in the world that he's created. So here's the question. What will you do with Jesus? Because you see, what's amazing is in this moment, the disciples of Jesus, those who knew God and were saved by Jesus, these guys had every reason to be told by Jesus, do not be afraid. Why? Because Jesus is standing between us and the Father. That's why they had no reason to be afraid. But let me just say, if you face God in eternity, if you stand before God without Christ as your mediator, if you stand before God without Him standing between you and the Father as an intercessor, then that majesty and glory will be something to be afraid of. That majesty and glory will be terrifying and not a delight. If you don't have Christ, then when you hear the Father's voice, you have everything to be afraid of. Because you'll then meet God not as Savior and friend and lover of your soul. You'll meet God as judge. You'll meet God as perfect judge who will always do right. And so here's the question. Will you come to Christ, the glorious one, the God-man who loves and saves his people? Will you come to him to trust in him and his work? Or will you continue to turn the other way? And for my brothers and sisters in here who have found yourself in a pattern of sin, you found yourself in a pattern of indifference, You found yourself in a pattern of honestly feeling like giving up. Maybe you find yourself after 20 years of being in Christ, still struggling with the same things, feeling this is about as far as you can go in your relationship with God because I'm not changing. Maybe God's going to leave me the way that I am. Will you see that God is faithful? And when he makes promises to change you and to be there for you and to embrace you and to fill you, and to empower you, that that is a promise that you can keep. It's as sure and as amen as every promise that led to the transfiguration. So what will you do with God's promises? Will you embrace them? Will you rejoice in them? Or will you be indifferent? We're going to come now 
to prayer and then baptism and then the Lord's table. But I'm gonna say before we get to the Lord's table,